Okay, so I'm Jan, I'm one of the original founders of Mendeley, um, which is a software tool that we build as researchers to address our own problems. Um, so we actually kind of were users that rose to the point of attention that Elsevier then made us an offer to acquire the business in 2013. And then I, I've been within Elsevier for about three and a half years helping with all the digital efforts around the Mendeley integration and uh, ramping up software development uh, and I've left the business in, at the end of October. So I'm, I'm now talking here as kind of an independent entrepreneur if you like, but I hope I still have some really interesting things to share with you. So I'm going to talk about the rise of, of the user and, and actually in retrospect many of the things that we did become much clearer to me now. So the rise of the, of the users is very much driven by, by users, by user-driven innovation, actually. So what does that mean? That usually means that a user has some sort of problem, such as when we were PhD students, we had PDF documents, the published journal articles that we would have on our hard disk, and we didn't find a proper way to organize and handle all this information um, that we would have to download from databases and publishers. So we have that problem. And we tried to solve our own problem, and the result of that eventually became Mendeley. Now, specifically, however, for, for the time that I worked at Elsevier eventually, the question is actually, who, who is the user? Who are the people that you want to take care of? Because as we just saw in, the, in this other discussion, um, you know, from a, from a publishing perspective, you have users who are potentially different from the people who pay the bill, who, who pay the invoice. So I think it's, it's very crucial that in that business you actually really understand who are the people that you want to address with your solution. So it's also important to understand the, the community. So what, I've, what I think is, is still happening in our industry is that, you know, I, I also saw just a tweet here before, is that, that there are not many solutions that directly address the end user needs. So one tweet here just said, why can't we have a panel where we have researchers on top who actually share what are their problems today and what are maybe ways for publishers or service providers in that space to address direct end user problems. So in effect, it's actually an opportunity to innovate. It's, it's in fact, I think for the companies um, that are in this space, actually a need to provide these services to those end users. And it's also in line with what people expect. Like if you have a great user experience, say for example an Amazon one-click checkout button, why can't I have the same experience when I want to get hold of a PDF in our industry? Why do I still have to log in five to ten times in different masks, like redirects, go th uh, through different hoops, library pages, publisher pages, until I eventually, uh, maybe, if I'm lucky, get the PDF? I, I still think that's still a problem. So the result of, of that problem is people are looking for the best possible way to solve that problem. So here comes SciHub, and that just solves that problem. Now, whether that's good or bad, I'm not going to comment on that, but you know, just in terms of where well, there's a problem, people are trying to address this problem because no one else is really addressing it, and then we lose control. So in effect, if we think about the users and, and, and what we can do there is I think actually the users are the solution. So it's not something that, oh God, the users want and they, and they maybe they share PDF documents or you know, they go somewhere else and don't come to us. Like, I think we need to think around the users as actually showing us the path to the solution. And the way we can actually do this is, luckily, we have the internet, is we, we can build engagement platforms. We can build platforms to actually communicate to users to learn what they want to do. And sometimes, you know, I said here, the stuff users don't express. Sometimes the users actually don't really exactly know what they want. They just follow eventually a path that maybe someone else shows them. But if we are close to the users, then we might be able to interpret for them actually what might be the best solution for them. And it gives us, and we had this as well before, it gives us, it gives us insight into, into the behavior of the users. Which buttons do they click? Or which buttons, buttons don't they click, for example? And it also provides an opportunity to innovate in monetization. I mean, we've, um, 
started to demonstrate that at the time with Mendeley, where eventually we had so many end users that we could build an institutional model where we said to institutions, hey, you know, dear university library or dear institution, if you want to know how people are interacting with the content that you are subscribing to, rather than just tracking a download, if you really want to know, you know, how often do they read a paper, where do they read it, do they read it on mobile, how many people do they share it with, then we can tell you. And if you want to know that, then of course it's a, it's a service that we would like to provide to you, and then we, we would sell a Mendeley institutional edition to an institution. So there are also ways in monetization. So then thinking about the way how digital innovation can help us with that. I think the, the most important thing I've learned, you know, after we um, have sold uh, Mendeley to Elsevier and then working in that capacity at Elsevier is really that this is a very, very distinct type of skill set that you need to think about having in-house. It's, it's, I call this a kind of a digital skill set. You know, and, and the foremost idea is that you're open to failure. You try because you don't really know, neither do the users, but so you need to be prepared to, to take the hit and, and to accept that maybe it wasn't the right way, so you do it another way. So you really create a culture of, well, if it didn't work the first time and it didn't, didn't work the second time, we're already cleverer than, than we were before. It needs to be very data-driven. As we said earlier, like, you know, we need to understand what buttons are users clicking on and which buttons are users not clicking on. It needs to be iterative, fast. Right? You need to have an agile methodology in place. You need to have team structures in place that support this iterative uh, strategy. And a very strong focus on user experience because that's eventually what, what drives the user engagement. So when we think about uh, digital user platforms, why is this actually important and what does this mean? There is a very interesting blog post on uh, Stratechery um, which talks about, it's actually called the theory of aggregation. And the idea behind that is that in each value chain that you typically have, you have suppliers, you have distributors, and then you have the customers or consumers. And in the pre-internet times, and that's kind of the first half of the screenshot of the picture there, the way to kind of get outsized profits is for you, for example, as a distributor, to backwards integrate with a supplier. That's pre-internet. So, for example, as a publisher, you would kind of you know, contract the authors, like a newspaper publisher, you would contract the authors, and, and so forth, and you would produce the content, and then you as a distributor had kind of a way to reap the profits from that, like by vertical integration backwards. That was one way, and the other way was, of course, to try to get a monopoly uh, in kind of a, ho in a horizontal space. But usually people would try to integrate uh, vertically backwards. And the reason for that is, of course, because there were costs associated with distribution, right? If you wanted to distribute uh, newspapers uh, to the customers, there were costs associated with that. And, um, uh, and so people, uh, you know, integrated backwards. Now, with the invention of the internet, those distribution costs basically have gone to zero. Right? So there's no, let's say, competitive advantage anymore to just say we're a distributor. So what you then can see in digital platforms in the typical consumer industries, those guys then understood that actually it's not a competitive advantage anymore to backwards integrate with the suppliers, but to actually forward integrate with the customers and own the customers and modu uh, uh, modularize the suppliers. So Google, right, owns the customers. And they can then direct them to that newspaper article from that publisher and that newspaper article from that publisher. So they modularize the suppliers and forward integrate with the customers. The same is true for Airbnb, the same is true for Uber. So, and the problem is if, if, you, don't, if you don't play along those lines, but you're reliant on those platforms, then you have as a dependent party no other chance than to evolve with them being dependent on them. For me, the good news, though, is that I think even in this platform model, in our industry, there is a need for a trusted source. So we have the, um, you know, let's say, the, 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 you know, all the discussions about the, face, uh, the fake news, right? So I think there is a very, very valuable role to play for publishers because such a platform model needs to have trusted sources to participate in that, for that to work and, and function in a, in a content-producing industry.
And similarly, I think the skill of a publisher is also that, you know, in this highly technologized you know, technology world, you know, I, I still truly believe there's the need for human intervention, human interaction, uh, ingenuity, and so on and so forth. And then there's the second piece, which I think is good news for our industry, which is the power that you get from combining technology and content together. And as well, you can see this happening in other industries, AT&T at the moment buying Warner, you know, a uh, huge infrastructure provider buying a content producing business in order to get more out of it. Now, what I have, would say is in our industry, we see too little of that, in particular, too little of that from let's say the content owners trying to move into technology to actually really understand this thing what I mentioned earlier. It's not about just setting up PDF downloads you know, on a website. Right? I, I think it really truly means building this digital skill set. Because if you're able to, then you're actually able to redirect traffic. You're able to engage people. And here again, like one example, SciHub, just completely eliminating all the search costs that, that are in the market. Because no one else is addressing the problem of this high search costs for end users, you know, the next best solution, unfortunately, is being picked up by users. Because the transaction costs are zero, the search costs are zero. So that's that's how that's how it goes. And in our side, in our in our world, I think it's then not only in order to provide a PDF for download, because they can maybe get this somewhere else, but actually make it useful solve the problem of the end user, which means and requires that you need to understand the problem of the end user in the first place. Which then brings us basically to the question around formats versus ecosystems. So it's not about, and, and you know, my colleague here just mentioned that before as well, it's not just, you know, people, end users also don't worry whether it's now it's a PDF or it's a HTML. So it's not really about, well, it's not really about the format, right? Okay, I deliver my web, my content via website, we can also have it, we maybe can also have it on mobile. That doesn't really matter. That's kind of almost a given based on the experience that end users have from other industries. But it's about thinking around this platform, thinking about actually how can I create an ecosystem that helps my users and my customers to solve their problems. So what's then the impact on, on the publishing industry and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the result from that? There was another blog post from Reid Hoffman, who um, is the founder of LinkedIn. And what he argues for is, uh, he says basically, we should think about moving from a purely transactional model, which is I go to this website, do a search, get the PDF, and then I go away. Go from that transactional model and move towards a networked model. So what else can I do with the content, right? If you download a PDF from Science Direct, immediately import it in, in, in Mendeley, you have access to it on your mobile phone, right? So you create a network type of ecosystem where with each end user interaction, you learn more about the user, can then drive recommendations as a feature and so forth, right? So it's not just about the transaction of, well, I need to have one more download, I need to have, like, be able to say I have one more reader, but actually, can I create this ecosystem? And, and another way of looking at that, and also looking at this uh, theory of aggregation, is, is a slide that I, that I like to show. Is in, in our world, the way I see this is, is a simplified world, a uh, simplified view, but I hope it gets my message across, is that we have a lot of very good and valuable content in our space. You know, publishers doing a, a great job in, in doing that. And on, on top of that, you then have maybe service providers who provide kind of a, a, an additional, let's say, layer of information, uh, automated, automatic tagging, semantic enrichment, and so forth. But, you know, until maybe five years ago, no one had thought about the users, the community, what types of tools do these people need? until, you know, I would say Mendeley is an example, we have maybe digital science, maybe another example. But it's not a lot, really. If you look at the overall value and the spend of that money and where it goes to, this is like really, really little, really slim. Now, what happens, however, if tomorrow that little thing becomes the means through which end users engage with content, search content, share content, look for content, and we don't know about this. We don't know how this works. We haven't built this user engagement. We haven't invested in those platforms. I think it's a problem because then other people will do this for us. And that they will do it for us or for the industry, we can see again from other industries. 
in those other industries, those people who understand those mechanisms about engagement, you know, the almost near zero transaction costs, they are taking the revenues and they are taking the profits that were generated in the newspaper, music industries, they're taking that and, you know, building their own business on top of that. Even more than what happens if you can, let's say, commoditize trust, such as Airbnb does, and you enable actually people to create content within your own platform. I think that would be a big challenge to content producing businesses or businesses who see themselves in the space of, you know, we are responsible for the content, if then some of these players actually move into that space as well, because you actually also commoditize trust and not only just the transaction. And that is a structural change in the industry, potentially. And that is a change in the ecosystem, and that's why it's not about formats, but about the ecosystem and the platforms. The way, of course, to achieve this is via software. So if you don't under understand software, if you don't combine content with technology, with software, then I think that's a problem, because software can hit very fast, because it's iterative, as we had before. You know, people in this space who start up are very, uh, they don't have problems with making failure. Right? So it, it hits fast, and then when it hits, it can hit very hard. Also because there are very low barriers to entry. Like when we started Mendeley, I mean, we didn't have any barrier to entry. We just could, you know, develop some code and see how it goes, and if that goes well, and then you have enough investors who, you know, potentially pile behind that. So the way to go about this is actually to build an ecosystem before someone else can do it before you. That you address the, the end user needs before someone else can do this. So that's kind of why I think these platforms and ecosystems play such an important role. Um, and that's why I think, you know, we need to think about the long-term investment view. And why is this long-term? You know, these types, even though they are fast iterations and you can see short-term success or failure very quickly, it still takes up to five to ten years to actually get really meaningful impact in this space. I mean, uh, Mendeley was sold after year five. You know, you see the other players like in, 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 in the, um, in the, um, in the end consumer industries, yeah, Google exists since many, many years, Facebook actually since many, many years. And a, a further indication for that is, is this statistic which shows how long does it build, to, uh, does it take to build a technology empire and it's kind of measured, so to say, 50 million in terms of uh, revenues or exit value. And you can see that the average duration for a company to get to that threshold is, you know, around eight, nine years until you actually really become meaningful. So, you know, when you, when you think about this, this is not being solved in a year or in, you, in two years' time. You need to have a long-term view. But equally so, if somebody else is committed to do that and has three or four years' advantage, it's very hard to kind of uh, keep up with that. So how did we do this at Mendeley then, um, in particular when, after the integration uh, with, with Elsevier? Now, what I, I'm quite happy to say is that Within Elsevier, we were very empowered, right? As the kind of the software generation, we said, okay, we understand this, we're really committed to that, and we had a team of 50, which we then grew to about 200 people, really empowered to change this and to make a positive contribution. And then, again, the second piece to that is, and I, it's a reflection on what I mentioned in the beginning, is kind of the company culture. The idea of, it's okay to fail. It doesn't matter, right? Try again. You need to have, you need to bring the right people on board who are a bit, maybe more kind of rebel. I heard that word rebel uh, quite a few times. Even though we, of course, want to have an impact. So maybe we do it differently, but we want to have an impact. So in the end, we wanted to work towards the positive, uh, towards a positive outcome. But, but there is, of course, something that you need to take into account, which is kind of how do you deal with this uh, company culture issue. Also, uh, luckily, you know, as it is, very, very committed to fund this whole enterprise, to really put money behind this. And that allowed us then to explore different types of revenue models. We had a B2C revenue model uh, and, you know, end users paying, uh, and then eventually also the Mendeley Institution Edition, which is again like a very different revenue model from all of the revenue models um, that as we ever, ever had before. Because it actually means selling software rather than, rather than content. So I think it's actually an opportunity to become relevant, or maybe relevant again, depending on where you see yourself, right? Relevant for maybe upstarts like Mendeley, it was really an opportunity to become relevant in that space. 
And uh, you know, we felt like also with Elsevier, it's, it's really a good space actually to become relevant, further relevant in the digital space. And and in conclusion, is is, is essentially is is the user-driven innovation as a solution, and not being afraid of that, but embracing it. But it also means that you cannot have ownership in this space without understanding this whole issue around digital skills and without understanding the impact of digital platforms and ecosystems. The combination of content, as I said earlier, is, is an opportunity, I think, for the industry. It's not about formats, it's about the ecosystems, and we need to think not in transactional ways, but in networked ways. And lastly, I think one way to approach this is, you know, I realize not every company can do everything by themselves. So what's the way to get there? So I think, you know, some way of looking into this startup world as a type of a layer of R&D activity, engaging with startups, I think would be a way, an additional way to approach this. And I think there are enough opportunities in our space to engage with these types of startups. Thank you very much. Anthony Watkins, and I'm doing my job, but I'm also enjoying it because it's such a good presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. What are you doing? I see you working on a small startup, but what, what is your angel activities directed at, and what are you looking to invest in? Okay, well, I mean, I guess that's a very personal question. So, <coughs> personally, I think I, I truly believe in our industry and in our space. So, what I, when I invest, I usually try to invest in companies that try to solve call it non-obvious problems. So problems that you actually really truly understand only if you're familiar with that industry. So say, for example, in our space, right? I mean, stuff like Mendeley, no one outside of our industry would, ever, would have ever thought about like an idea like Mendeley. Another area is, uh, for example, um, legal analytics, right? So I've invested in a business that's a legal analytics business trying to facilitate the relationship between lawyers and, 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 and firms, contracting law firms, because my experience also was, <laughs> you know, when you contract lawyers, then after three months' work, you're always kind of blown out of the water by the bills that rack up. So how, how can you solve this problem? How can you create this transparency in that space? So in, in short, you know, I, I try to invest in, in this type of business, publishing, professional information services, education, um, and I need to see that, that there is this non-obvious problem that I can, you know, relate to somehow. Thanks. Pippa Smart, editor of Learning Publishing. Uh, great presentation, many thanks. Thank you. I think you made a really valuable point about the difference between delivering content and delivering services. And I particularly like your slide, the way that you flipped it round. Um, just as a thought on that, one of the problems that I see that we have in the industry is we're really bad, I'm trying to use polite words here, at delivering the more like this. And one of the concerns is that on the one half researchers, um, serendipity has played a, a good part in research. We've now lost that a lot with the internet because we're doing more directional searching. And I wonder how, you know, if you've got any ideas for how we could improve the more, you know, if you like this, you'll love this type of thing within the industry. Because I think that is something that we really miss when we deliver content. Well, I mean, it, there, I think there are probably two answers. So the short, I would say, more functional answer to that is that there are, I mean, there are algorithms, there are proven models and methods to actually implement stuff like that, as we've shown with Atapon, as Atapon has shown, you know, to actually just deliver that, right? You have on your website, uh, you basically say, okay, you have that content and you can run data science in the background that then shows more like this content on the website, right? So it's, it's a very, let's say, feature-driven approach. Um, 
you know, what that of course requires is that you have the right skills and the right people in house and that you're able to collect that data that powers those engines, right? So there's already kind of, you already start to step into this, well, you need to bring other people on board maybe than, than you know, maybe than the majority of, of, of staff that you have. However, it does not really solve maybe of some of the bigger problems, right? Maybe it delivers, yes, one additional piece of content, but I, you know, again, like I would advise to then think more about how can, how can I go even further than just delivering yet another transaction, and that's what I meant with okay, how you know, you know, what is actually the problem that you want to address? Maybe the person at that point actually doesn't maybe need or want more content because people are inundated with content. There's so much. I, I don't know, right? But what you can do is you can then think about okay, what additional problems can you solve, or what is the underlying problem that you want to solve? One way of doing it. Bring people in in-house, do user testing sessions with researchers, invite them. We did that a lot at Mendeley. We invited many, many people, come to the office, get them in touch with the product managers, record them when they're trying and click on buttons. I mean, it's astonishing what, what you can learn by just looking how people do things, right? You have mapped out all this great idea and then they, they, they already failed finding the first button to trigger that recommendation. If there's somebody. Um, in the meantime, just a comment on, on that. I mean, one of the things I think is interesting, somebody said to me the other day, well, if all content was open and free, then we wouldn't need authentication and access management, all those kind of things. But of course, uh, managing identity is crucial to them being able to provide those kind of services because you have to know who it is who's using the piece of material to know what other recommendations to make and so forth. And in the old days, when I worked in the public library business, People would go to the library and they'd say, why is your website not as good as Amazon? You don't make recommendations based on my past reading. And the librarians would say, well, that's because we don't keep any information about your past because we're obsessed with confidentiality. And there's a bit of a trade-off between exposing yourself to someone so that they can market to you, to go back to Jacob's thing in an appropriate way, versus being very, I'm not logged in, I'm completely uh, in stealth mode, but then I can't have some of those so there's a kind of trade-off. Uh, right, one last question, or are we done? We're too intimidated. Uh, no, Paul's not intimidated. Uh, down the front here. Hi, uh, Paul Peters from Um In the context of the scholarly publishing world that we're looking at, do you think that user needs can properly be met by individual publishers limited only to that publisher's content? Or do you really see that because users have to interact with content from many publishers, that any true solution is going to be coming from third parties, which might be independent or might somehow have a connection to the publishers themselves. Well, I mean, my, I've, I've never been, like, even though maybe I've been characterized as a radical, but I, I'm usually not very radical in my opinion. So I don't think it's either one or the other. I think the, the, the way to go will be somewhere in the middle. Um, and so, you know, if you look, if you compare, like, how you interact, right, you also don't just just use one piece, one information source, like one newspaper. Like, but you get some of the news from Facebook, which is an independ independent platform, and you still go to The Guardian or, you know, uh, The Economist or something like that. So there's neither, there's neither one or the other exclusively. It would be a mix and a hybrid. Um, and I think publishers are doing an increasingly good job in taking care of, of their stuff, I agree. But what the industry is really lacking is kind of the more broader solution. And that's why Google Scholar is dominant. That's why Sci-Hub is a problem. Because no one in that industry is taking care of that thing, right? Because everybody is more like thinking about their own thing, and potentially rightly so. But it leaves that gap, which then others step into, change that model of distribution and aggregation. And then if you just thought about one thing, then you kind of, you know, you just, you know, either you fight it or you evolve with it. I mean, there's, there's not many options, right? So I think it's, it needs both. And it more, more increasingly it needs kind of the, you know, something to find that serves across publishers. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, in a moment we're going to go to break. Um, so it's a 30 minute break. Uh, the break is sponsored by Pub Factory, so thank you, uh, O'Reilly Media's Pub Factory, for that. Um, and then we're going to be back here at 3.30 prompt for the highlight of the conference, which is the workshop feedback, where you get to see whether the other workshops that you weren't in were as 
talented and brilliant as you were. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. But before we break, let's just all thank Jan for his excellent presentation. Thank you.